Immediate Empiricism by John Dewey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Immediate Empiricism by John Dewey. Professor Bakewell writes as follows in an open letter to me in this journal concerning immediate empiricism. My difficulty, in short, is simply this. Either everything experienced is real exactly as and no further than it is then and there experienced, and then there is no occasion to speak of correcting or rectifying experience, or there is in every experience a self-transcendency, which points beyond that thing as experienced for its own reality. And then goodbye to immediatism. And in a footnote he says that my view is atomistic, chopping reels off from one another, and that if this consequence is avoided by making the earlier experience contain implicitly the latter to which it leads, immediatism gives way to a doctrine of mediation. There was once a botanist, who suggested that instead of deducing botany from the concept of plants and from certain allied concepts, the proper method was to study plants to see what each was in itself. Whereupon an opponent replied that such a doctrine destroyed botany. Take the case of a seed, he argued. Either you mean that this seed, just as it is now and no further, is real, and then growth is impossible or else there is in the seed a self-transforming somewhat which changes it, first into a sprouting plant, and then, finally, into a mature plant with seeds of its own. And then goodbye to the idea that the reality of the seed is to be sought in just what the seed now and no further is. Moreover, he continued, since each plant in itself is something different from every other, the doctrine makes relation of plants to one another, and hence generalization, and hence science, impossible. Whereupon the first-mentioned botanist replied that either a given seed is alive and capable of growth, or dead and incapable of becoming a plant, and that the actual state of affairs in this respect is precisely one of the things to be determined by a study of the particular seed, that it is of the very essence of the method that the question of further or no further should be settled by reference not to general notions, but by reference to the determinate character of the particular seed. Moreover, it was just by a study of each plant in itself that one would find out whether it was something unrelated, atomistic, or something genetically and responsibly connected with other plants, relationship being precisely an affair of the determinate character of the seed. In other words, while I expressly state in my article, 1, that a thing which is rectified in a subsequent cognitive experience contains within itself, that is, as a part of its own concrete determinate thinghood, the elements of the transformation of its own content, and 2, expressly disclaim the possibility of deriving any conclusions whatever from the concept of immediate experience, Professor Bakewell expressly assumes, one, that the very concept of immediate experience carries with it some necessary implication regarding the character or nature of what is experienced, and two, that it precludes any continuity of experienced things. As an immediate empiricist, I can only reply that it is two things as experienced that I go for instruction as to the continuity, transformation, and mediation and that it is just because I find things immediately experienced as continuous and as self-rectifying that I believe in continuity and self-rectification. Compare the distinction of cognitive and cognized in the former article, and the reference to the importance of the drift, occasion, and contexture of things, distinctions which are inherent and not external to the things. Does the transcendentalist believe that things as experienced are continuous? If yes, why should he charge an empiricist with ex officio denial of this empirical fact? But, if he holds that a transcendental principle or function is required to give continuity to what as experienced is chopped off, then he would seem to be the one denying an actual empirical continuity. 
I am always wishing that some transcendentalist would expound and expose his own positive doctrine about the problems which he accuses the empiricist of maltreating, instead of assuming that the transcendental position is self-evident, or at least thoroughly understood. Perhaps Professor Bakewell will help in this illumination. Bearing in mind that an important motive in developing the newer philosophy has been the conviction that mediation, continuity, reconstruction, and growth are facts which transcendentalism has failed consistently to define and account for. I do not understand the notion that because things of immediate experience are real, mediation cannot be real. I am quite sure that the logic of immediate empiricism would include mediation along with the categories subjective, objective, physical, mental, psychic, etc. See volume 2, page 399 and say, if you wish to find out what it means, go to experience and see what it is experienced as. I find difficulty in realizing the difficulty which one has with immediately experiencing something as mediate. I don't see any way of experiencing the mediate, any more than of experiencing a cat or a dog, except that of immediately experiencing it as what it is, viz. mediate. If I were to make a guess as to the origin of the difficulty, I should refer it to a mental habit of employing a conceptual instead of an empirical philosophy. Footnote. Lest I be charged with intimating that concepts are unreal and unempirical, I say forthwith that I believe meanings may be and are immediately experienced as conceptual. End footnote. A habit so inveterate as to display itself even when one is attempting to appreciate the position of an empiricist. I conclude with a question and a remark. Does Professor Bakewell mean to deny, one, that all philosophic conceptions must somehow enter into experience, or two, that all experience is, as existence, immediate? The remark is that I quite meant my earlier statement, volume 2, page 399 that from the postulate I gave not a single philosophical proposition could be deduced, that its significance was that of affording a method of philosophical analysis. End of Immediate Empiricism by John Dewey